Oh, hello. Um, this little module is going to be uh, discussing allotropes or forms of carbon. And I have an overhead up here on the screen of some different allotropes of carbon. Uh, pure carbon, there are no carbon hydrogen, carbon oxygen bonds. Every atom here is uh, representing a carbon atom. There are three major allotropes of carbon. Diamond, diamond is pure carbon. Graphite, carbon graphite, pure carbon. And something called Buckminster fullerene, or more commonly a buckyball. There is another structure here, which was later determined, and that is, well, some type of variation of this buckyball, and that is a bucky tube, or a carbon nanofiber, carbon nanotube, as they're so called. Now, the idea behind diamond is that you have tetrahedral carbons. Take, for example, this carbon atom. It's going to be surrounded by four carbon neighbors, sp3 hybridized carbon atoms, bond angles exactly 109.5 degrees. Now, diamond is called things like uh, hardest substance naturally occurring, has a very high melting point, and these can be attributed to how many bonds there are in a diamond. I have a box of samples here. Sadly, these are not real diamonds. They're not even cubic zirconias. They're glass. And uh, pick these up from a jeweler that was using them as an education device to show different cuts on diamonds. We'll go ahead and pretend that this is a real diamond. A uh, diamond is pure carbon. People often ask, well, what about at the outside of the surface of the diamond? Are there carbon atoms just hanging out there? And what's attached to them? And uh, it's often believed that you have some O or some OH groups sticking off of the very outsides. But the bulk material is pure carbon. The structure model here is showing tetrahedral carbons. I'll just put my finger on one. And you can choose any one that you want. And what you'll find is bond angles of 109.5 degrees tetrahedral. Um, take, for example, the idea of heating up a diamond to melting it. In order to melt a diamond, what you'd have to do is give the substance enough energy that all of the bonds between the carbons would go ahead and break, and the carbon atoms could go ahead and flow over one another. Now, in order to do that, you have to provide so much heat to break all the bonds. Think of it as being like a bond per carbon atom. It's just an insane number of bonds that need to be broken. Uh, literature values show that carbon in the form of diamond melts near 3,600 degrees C, or 4,000 Kelvin in the ballpark of there. And that's outside sun, S-U-N, sun temperatures. So these melt at very, very high temperatures because there are so many, so many bonds. Another allotrope of carbon is the cheap one, or graphite. Now, graphite are fused six-membered rings, S. P2 hybridized carbons. You could think of this as resonance, maybe like double bond, single, double, single, double, single, alternating single and double bonds. There are no bonds. This is a dotted line just showing height. There are no bonds between this sheet of graphite and this sheet of graphite. There are no formal bonds connecting this carbon atom down to this one. This is simply showing that there's some distance between these sheets. Now, graphite is commonly used as a lubricant. Locksmiths will take the black graphite powder and squeeze it into a lock so the key slides in and out very simply. Now, that is kind of interesting because on the molecular level, we're looking at sheets of carbon graphite. You might think, well, if this sheet is not bonded to this sheet, they are variable. This could slide over this sheet, like you could have sheets of paper sliding over one another. There are no formal bonds hooking these together. So now, in our world, imagine a key going into a lock and sliding over graphite sheets. Graphite is extremely inexpensive. It's dug up from the Earth's surface. Think of coal and barbecue uh, charcoal briquettes. Graphite. Uh, Decades ago, not a century ago, but just decades ago, Buckminster fullerene, or commonly called the buckyball, was discovered. And it is C60, 60 carbon atoms arranged in hexagons and pentagons. There's a very simple way to show this in three dimensions, and that's with a soccer ball. A soccer ball, it turns out, is a series of fused hexagons and pentagons, and it has 60 vertices. When I first looked at a soccer ball, as a model for this Buckminster fullerene. I, uh, I was looking going, oh, 
there appear to me more than 60 vertices, 60 of these points. But in fact, I took a pencil and started counting one, two, three, and writing it on the ball so I wouldn't overwrite or uh, miss any. And in fact, I convinced myself there are 60. So 60 carbon atoms all formed into a ball. And uh, I've yet to hear of any really good uses for this to date. People have proposed perhaps putting some atoms inside or maybe even small molecules inside to deliver them or do something with them. It's thought that these can open up and form or fuse together, form long tubes. And so these are called carbon nanotubes or bucky tubes. The idea here is, is that you'd have a strong, strong fiber with excellent, excellent carbon-carbon bonding. Um, uses for these, perhaps they'll be used as filaments in electronic devices. Uh, maybe they'll be woven together to make, uh, well, high temperature, very strong strings. Uh, let's see. The model for graphite has these sheets. One, two, three sheets. And unfortunately, in our real world, have to have metal posts holding these layers up because otherwise they would just collapse upon each other. Model for the buckyball, a soccer ball, and a model for diamond tetrahedral carbons.